Okay, yes. Uh, thank you, Harold. It's nice to be in Vienna again. Uh, I think it's less warm than last time, which is good. <laughs> uh, and, and thank you for, for you know, organizing this nice workshop. Um, it's been a while um, since I've been to Vienna. Okay, um, so um, what I'm going to talk about, uh, well, this year I'm on sabbatical, so I'm also at the University of Amsterdam. Um, but uh, I'm going to talk, it's going to be a talk that's a little bit all over the map. Um, but um, let me preface it by, you know, there's mathematical objects I encounter regularly, okay? And the question is, how do they fit? Um, so I like to work in Hamiltonian formulation rather than path integrals. A lot of people prefer path integrals. Um, I just like Hamiltonians. Uh, and I still encounter integrals over the groups. So just because you're doing Hamiltonian physics doesn't mean you don't do matrix models. Um, and then uh, the other things that show up regularly are eigenvalues and character expansions. And I'll explain how you know, those show up. And then uh, character expansions are very closely related to Young diagrams. So I'll try to you know, put these things together. Um, so the, the, the title is strings, Young diagrams, and all that. So let's start with strings. So I'm going to start with one example. Um, uh, so by now, it's well known that perturbation theory in equal for young males leads to a spin chain dynamics of traces. Okay. Uh, the full n equal four spin chain is integrable to all others in perturbation theory. Uh, I don't think that we can ever have a mathematical proof of that directly because it requires computing Feynman diagrams to all orders, uh, which is not easy. But um, all the evidence, which is overwhelming, that you know you use integrability to make five, six, seven loop predictions and they come up in direct computations. Um, and I'm just citing the review mostly because there's over a thousand papers on this stuff. So uh, giving credit to everyone is easier to just send everybody to the review, okay? Um, and one can say that planar and equal four is essentially solved in some sense. Okay, um, so the question is, these are strings. Strings show up as spin chains from the point of view of gauge theory. So I'm going to tell you about another spin chain that shows up. And this time, it's the strong coupling expansion of large and QCD on the lattice. And this is based on a recent paper that I wrote with Hiroki Kawai, which is one of my students. Uh, we just showed up. And then, you know, in a certain sense, the first paper that did this was, you know, 1981 Kogut and collaborators. Um, so I'll start with a story which is, um, when you do the Kogut Saskin Hamiltonian, you have uh, gauge fields on a lattice. It's a Hamiltonian physics, so there's two things. There's uh, unitaries on the uh, links, um, and these are kind of like the X variables in quantum mechanics. And then there's electric fields on the links, and then um, the electric fields are like the velocities. Uh, and then the electric fields in unitary quantum mechanics are valued in the adjoint of the algebra. And then what you get here is some type of quadratic Casimir, and I'm putting all the factors of n in kind of the tooth coupling kind of calculation. So g squared n is the tooth coupling. Uh, so this term over here is usually what's called the plaquette operator. And this is the stuff that kind of goes around the square lattice. So it's a schematic form. Uh, so we'll do the strong coupling expansion. Strong coupling expansions means g squared n is big. So one over g squared n is small. So you throw away the plaquettes and you just keep the electric. Um, there's a lot of reasons to do this. One of the reasons I want to do this nowadays has to do with quantum computers because this is easy to diagonalize and then the presentation on quantum computers is easier standing on, on this side. But the point is that you start from this side, you start from the strong coupling expansion. Uh, and then we diagonalize the first term. So if you diagonalize the kinetic term, what you get is a Casimir for each one of the links. And then if you have a Casimir, what you have is a representation. You have three representations or four representations showing up on a link uh, or on, on a vertex. And then if you have a trivalent vertex, then you have some gauge constraint that says that uh, the conjugate of R3 needs to be an R1 times R2. If you have four vertices, there's some Lie algebra um, uh, statement that says that you have singlets that you can kind of contract these representations into singlet tensors. And how many of them there are, there's some kind of liberal Richardson coefficient, how many copies of R3 you get in R1 tensor R2. So there's some group information over here. 
Um, but we're going to go to large n. So at large n, uh, uh, when you start uh, at strong coupling, you have these strings, but the strings don't really move. And then they're just rigid. They're just floating in space, and they don't go anywhere. Um, so it's very far away from strings that slosh and move and, and, and are dynamical. These are kind of like rigid strings. Uh, and then the energy is the Casimir for each link. And if you're doing um, large n, then what you have is that um, the Casimir is roughly the number of boxes of these representations. So we have few representations or, or representations of small dimension. The quadratic Casimir is just the number of boxes of the representation. And therefore, you just count boxes uh, link by link. Um, uh, when you have plaquettes, you have uh, moves in the network, meaning that you change the configuration of the representation content. Uh, and then it produces local changes of flux. Uh, you can think of the electric field as a flux through these, these vertices, okay? Or through these, these links. Um, so for low dimension, they can be thought of as a gas of strings or loops, because then you're going to have very few boxes. And when you do the contractions, the matrix indices are going to contract uh, just like traces. Uh, you need to eventually get close to phase transition. This is called the roughening phase transition in this engaged theory uh, to see relativistic physics coming out, like a real dynamical QCD string. And it's badly broken by the fact that we're doing the strong coupling. Uh, you have to think about the matrix U as adding one unit of flux, and its adjunct removes one unit. Um, and then the wave functions are polynomials in U. This is one way to think about it. Okay, so what happens at large n is that the loops cannot break nor recombine, so you get a free gas of strings. Uh, and then we can concentrate on a single loop or open string. Basically, you can add very massive parts at the endpoints if you want to. And then the electric energy in that case is equal to the length of the loop. So you go from being on a situation where you have these very complicated, let's say, representation content to things where you're just following a loop around the lattice, and then um, charge conservation at each edge, or, sorry, uh, at each vertex means that the flux going in needs to be equal to the flux going out, and then you just need to follow a path. So the statement that you have strings uh, is that the Hilbert space of these objects can be represented for a single object as you have a starting quark, some end quark, and you just describe the path that you take. So you keep track of whether you go to left, to right, up or down. So you go from a complicated problem that has all these gauge variables to a simpler description of the path, which is just based on which direction you take. So this is the Google map version of the open string, right? So you say, uh, what's the route that you take from A to B? And then there's different routes that you can take, and then Depending on Google, sometimes there's different routes. Some take more time than others. Uh, here, the distance is the, the, the energy. OK. Yes. What? Oh, no, no, no. Uh, the, the, this is the fact that here you're going to the right, here you're going up. So the colors are basically the statement that, you know, that if you go to the right versus the left, you get different colors. So it has to be coloring the, the letters. So these are the directions. So the, the, the coloring here is just the directions. Okay. So once you have a path, like a straight path, and then once you add the plaquette operator, the plaquette operator can make a move on this string. So it can you know, add, let's say, some distortion. And then you can add more plaquettes, and the plaquettes can move these defects, if you want to think about these defects. So you can think of all of these uh, spin chains of defects. Uh, it's kind of like a dynamics of a 1D string. So the idea is that when you have perturbation theory starting from strong coupling, you're going to generate some type of effective spin chain, which is just telling you how you make moves in this collection of paths from A to B. Okay? So the point is that there's more than one path that has the same length from A to B. So if you have two paths with the same length, they have the same energy to start with. So you get some degenerate perturbation theory. And in degenerate perturbation theory, the first thing you need to do is diagonalize the Hamiltonian in the degenerate basis. So those are the ones that preserve the length of the string, because the length is the energy. So what you can do is you add a plaquette. The plaquette kind of can cancel this R and cancel this U. So this left arrow cancels the R. This down arrow cancels the U. But then you have to add an up and a down, so it makes a move from 
right up to up right. So it's something that basically lets you change the order of the alphabet that you have in your directions. Uh, and then we're doing quantum mechanics, so you get some Hamiltonian that tells you how to make these changes. Okay. So um, if you want to do computations, uh, these are wave functions of u, so you need to do overlaps, and then you end up with integrals over u with u elements, and then all the integrals reduced to this master integral uh, plus large m factorization, which tells you basically this is the only gauge invariant that you can mil build from u's on the same link, which is that the i is equal to l, the k is equal to j, and the one over n is because u and u dagger are inferences of each other, so when you contract the indices, you're supposed to get one. And then this tells you that I've normalized the u integral by, by one. Yes? Yes? Uh, yeah, so the point is that the plaquette has an extra factor of n. So it cancels some one over ends that show up, and you get something which is of the order of the Hoops coupling, right? So remember that in the uh, Hamiltonian, uh, the Hamiltonian has this extra factor of n. This extra factor of n at the strong coupling is the one that cancels these one over ends and gives you something that only depends on the Hoops coupling. Okay, so here I'm just keeping track of the effective Hamiltonian. Uh, so just by symmetries, if you have an R and a an U and you go to a UR, you're preserving the number of U's and the number of R's, and this is nearest neighbor. So if you preserve the your ups and the rights, then where you're actually preserving is a U1 symmetry, the number of up, down, left, right, independently of each other. Uh, for the two letter, we get a, it cannot be anything else. It's a nearest neighbor spin chain that preserves a U1, and that needs to be a member of the XXZ spin chain family. Uh, and then you figure out which one it is, and it happens to be the XX model. So the XX model is a particular spin chain that you get. Uh, and then the most interesting sector for the XX spin chain is the one where you have an equal number of ups and, and, and rights. So it's basically diagonal chain, because uh, that's the one that's the most degenerate. Okay. Uh, so the ground state in that case, or the XX spin chain, is solvable by free fermions. This is a mathematical statement that people proved in condensed matter physics in the, you know, the history of, of all these unequal for young Mill story. Um, so the ground state is a critical theory. It's equivalent to two free fermions, so it has a sequel one theory. So already in the general perturbation theory, you're seeing that there's some pieces of the string that have critical fluctuations. Oh, sorry. That have critical fluctuations, which is what you expect already in the in the. Thermodynamic limits. Okay, what happened to it? Okay, uh, I'll, I'll keep without it. Yes. Okay. So, um, so the QCD string is also a theory of critical fluctuations because of Goldstone bos bosons of spontaneous symmetry breaking. And you're already kind of getting the correct uh, C equals one covalent here. Okay, so what's the point? The XX spin chain. It's two plus one. Right, because this Hamiltonian physics, so there's an extra dimension, two plus one. Okay, more letters. So now let's say that we have up, right, and down. So usually there's this zigzag symmetry that tells you that u, u inverse or u, u dagger is equal to one. And then that basically tells you that an up and a down cannot be next to each other because they cancel. But it turns out that this theory is also integrable. And what you have to do is anytime you have an up followed by a right followed by a down, you kind of pad the up with the right one and you do a transformation of variables and you can basically map this pin chain with this kind of non-trivial a blockade that tells you that u and b cannot be next to each other to something where you can map the problem to another spin chain with fewer sides with this padding and the up and the down can be now next to each other and then you ask what spin chain do you get and you get some other nearest neighbor spin chain with three letters 
And the idea is that even though originally there was some blocking in the sense that three letters had some combinations that you could not transition to, once you add this padding, uh, you can transition between all possible combinations. And then the spin chain then ignores zigzag symmetry, which is this up-down thing, because you can suddenly allow these kind of uh, configurations. Uh, and then you do not allow a left and a right to swap each other or up and down to swap each other, uh, but it's still nearest neighbor. And then we wrote the R matrix, and because we wrote the R matrix and showed that it's obeyed young Baxter, it turns out that this problem is also integral. So the surprise here is not that we got an XX spin chain on the diagonal, is that when you do up and then this three letter problem is integral. And then if you go to higher dimensions, if you do up left forward, so the 3D problem, uh, it's also an integrable spin chain, and I think it has been found in condensed matter physics. I just got an email today about all the people I ignored in the paper. So yes, <laughs> it's been known since about, uh, sometime in the 90s when people generalized the XX model to UN. Okay. Um, and we know a little bit less about the ULF equal occupation chain, meaning we know less, meaning my student and I know less, apparently, People do know more in the condensed matter literature and they've uh, understood it a little better. Um, and if we also ignore zigzag symmetry in all possible you know, lattices that are rectangular in however many dimensions, and we basically apply the same rules that you ignore the zigzag but you don't allow the swaps of things that invert each other and, 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 and that are kind of forbidden by zigzag and you just don't allow those to swap, you always get solutions with an R matrix that is soluble. Uh, this is a strong coupling approximation where you're just doing the general perturbation theory. So it's the leading order, the general perturbation theory calculation. Leading just leading order, the general perturbation theory. Yes. Yes, you're supposed to think about it as the world sheet theory, except that since this is very non-relativistic, because um, uh, you've broken Lorentz invariance very much between the time and the space directions, and the string central mass cannot really move yet, uh, then this is some version of a world sheet theory which is very far from the continuum string theory. Uh, but it's still kind of soluble in some sense. Uh, so the idea is that much to my surprise, we got some you know, random other uh, spin chains that are integrable, and this happens again and again. That you're not looking for them and they show up and then suddenly they're integrable. Uh, I don't expect this to persist to higher orders in perturbation theory. But if you have integrability already there, that controls things for a very long time. Uh, meaning that you know, the perturbations that destroy integrability don't come and, and, and damage you immediately. So integrability will hopefully dictate what's going on for a bit longer. Okay, so this is the story of strings. So this is how we get strings. We write spin chains and then we go to higher reporters and then we try to understand the effective theory of these spin chains. And if we're lucky, it's integrable and therefore I don't have to put it on a quantum computer. Uh, meaning there's other analytical techniques like very answered. If we're not lucky, which is the generic case, then you do have to put it on a computer of sorts and because we're doing Hamiltonian physics, um, it's hard to put on a classical computer because of sign problems. Time evolution problems have a sign problem in, in path integral formulations. Uh, so if you have a quantum computer, then you can do spin chains, and then they cost a lot less than doing volumes of QCD. So this is just a pitch to study quantum computers for everyone. Okay, so the next thing is Lego characters, no, characters. Um, so there's gonna be characters and eigenvalues. So when you have a matrix, you can have eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Uh, and then you can have characters. So let's start with how VPS states in n equals four super young guys. So uh, half VPS states are protected by supersymmetry. And in particular, if you know them at weak coupling, you know them as strong coupling. So they're very protected by supersymmetry. Uh, they depend on a single complex, uh, not single couple complex field. This is what I autocorrect those. Let's keep away. Single complex scalar field, um, Z. Their correlation functions are also protected, so they can be computed via Gaussian matrix quantum mechanics. 
Um, and then there was this very famous paper by Kolyu, Jeveki, and Angulam. Antal is not here yet, Angulam is here. Uh, is Corley still in the field? No. Okay. <laughs> so uh, Sanjay is here. He can actually explain how this works since they did the computations. So they did the pre field theory result and they showed that an orthogonal basis is provided by characters of representations. Um, and then the representations are classified by young diagrams. So if you have a young diagram that tells you you have a tensor, let's say five indices, and then the three on the top are going to be totally symmetrized. The two on the bottom are going to be totally symmetrized. And then there's some anti-symmetrization that happens part. And then they're containing a you know, tensor to the fifth product of some auxiliary uh, representation of the of the fundamental of the No, this is just finite n, and this is a complete basis of happy PS states. And then what I'm telling you right now has no large n in it, it's just a finite n result. Right? There's no large n any longer, it's just finite n. So we've gone from large n to finite n. Um, and then what I'm going to tell you is the same story with our new point of view, which is uh, something that we did with one of my students, Shannon Wang, uh, and then Shannon and Adolf Holguin, which is also one of my students, did some follow-up work, uh, and then Hailin also did some of these things. And what I'm going to tell you about is that uh, there's another way to approach the same problem that uses generating functions in a different way than a strictly pure combinatorial point of view. So the original construction was essentially purely combinatorial. Now I'm going to tell you something that uses generating functions. And then to do a little bit of that, I need to tell you a little bit of the operator state correspondence in conformal field theory. So usually if you have an operator in conformal field theory of fixed dimension, then you can associate to it a state, which is the operator state correspondence, and the dimension of the operator is the energy of the state. And this can also be thought of as the same operator acting on the ground state of the conformal field theory in the field. And then the operator Z that one writes in N equal for Young Mills to classify operators gets related to a raising operator of the same Z field, uh, which is the S wave of the, of the field operator and the sphere quantization in perturbator B. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna do something which you can do in quantum mechanics, which is you basically, instead of writing things in terms of occupation number states, you go to coherent states. So coherent states are basically classical states of the harmonic oscillator, and if you have n squared harmonic oscillators, you can do a coherent state of n squared harmonic oscillators by just introducing an n by n matrix of parameters that just generates for you the most general coherent state. Okay. Uh, coherent states are complete, so this is a generating function for all half EPS states. The only problem is that when you look at this expression, it's not gauge invariant because lambda is just a matrix of parameters, and the A daggers are matrices, but they, 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 they're not gauge invariant, so when you do this expansion, you get non-invariant states. Okay. So this is another complete set of states that has states beyond what you want. Uh, we want the gauge invariant states because we're doing a gauge theory in equal for your meals. So you have to basically do coherent states projected to the gauge invariant version, so you just apply the projector to the gauge invariant. Okay. okay. And then the point is that this projector um, is a matrix integral. So the projector is basically you average over the gauge orbit of the operator A dagger, and then you write a projected state by basically saying you integrate over the matrices U, the U are UN matrices, your auxiliary gauge transformation, so that when you integrate over U, you generate gauge invariant states. So what you do is you do lambda u a dagger u inverse and u a u inverse. That's the way the operator transforms under u and gauge transformations. So once you integrate over u, you're averaging over the group, you get a gauge invariant state. Okay? And then if you look at this expression and you squint a little bit, you realize that this expression over here is this Gressan is so prices where integral. And then this Gressan is so Schubert-Parisi integral is known since the 80s. Uh, 
And then the lambda is something that can be expanded in characters. So you can expand in characters of representations of lambda times characters of representations of eight dagger z. Uh, you can also expand in terms of eigenvalues, but because a dagger is operator valued, you cannot diagonalize it in some canonical way, in a nice way, because you're diagonalizing operators uh, by matrices and not just C numbers. But the characters are well-defined objects, and these are the same characters that Sanjay and company were discussing in their, their computations. These are the gauge invariant states. So the lambda is you basically take this and apply it to the vacuum. So this integral over here, apply it to the vacuum, this object has this expression. Um, yes, the R are uh, sums over, over uh, UN Yang tables. The D sub R is the dimensions, yes. Yes. That sounds familiar, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I forgot the vacuum. Uh, I need to update the slides before I post them. Um, it will happen at 10 p.m. at night. Copy paste doesn't work as, as well as I want. Okay, so the point is that lambda is this object acting on the vacuum. This is a number, and these are characters. So you get a, a linear combination of characters. Okay. You can also do an overlap of lambda bar lambda, and then you use the coherent state, you know, calculation to get the lowering operators past the raising operators with the usual Baker Campbell Hausdorff formula, and then. Uh, you can show that this overlap is just a matrix integral where lambda and lambda bar are honest matrices. Okay? And then this is now the BPIZ integral as an integral with numbers as opposed to an integral with some operators valued in the center. Uh, so you can easily combine this expression, which also has a character expansion in terms of characters of lambda and lambda bar, to show that the characters of the representations are orthogonal to each other, and that these denominators that show up in this formula are exactly the normalization of the states. So the point is that with these generating function techniques, uh, we cleaned up a lot of the combinatorics that uh, Sanjay and his collaborators did into something that does the same thing a little bit easier. And because it's an integral, this integral can be done by localization. It's one of these famous integrals that can be done by localization. Localization means that um, not only does the integral only depend on eigenvalues, so you can take lambda and lambda bar to be diagonal, but the integral can be done by localization. That means that it's configured cor correctly, meaning that if lambda and lambda bar have the right type of eigenvalue distributions, then uh, only one saddle matters. And then you can, instead of doing a complicated combinatorial object, you get a Gaussian integral around that saddle, and that dominates. So if you pick your lambda parameters carefully, you might end up in a situation where only one saddle matters, and then you're doing perturbation theory on that saddle. New. And then that's very convenient because um, you can study other things, OK? So there's a lot of related matrix integrals where instead of integrating over u being a unitary, you integrate over u being an isometry, and that allows lambda to be instead of an n by n matrix, you can allow it to be an m by n matrix where m is smaller than n. So it's possible to do integrals with generalized uh, versions of this. And then the integrals over these unitaries will also be un invariant. And and produce everything you want. Okay, so what's important about these numbers lambda is that the eigenvalues of lambda, as I told you, everything can be reduced to eigenvalues, so they, they, start, have, they start having meaning, and then these eigenvalues become space-time coordinates for the d-brains in the sense of coherent states. So these are kind of the center of the eigenvalue in terms of, of coherent states. Um, and then you think of an eigenvalue as a d-brain, you can add strings to it, and how do you add strings? Uh, you look at vectors, eigenvectors of lambda parameter, and then you decorate strings with vectors that tell you that you end in a particular eigenvalue, and then you insert u, u inverse to, when you do the integral over the gauge group, 
to make sure that the end result is gauge invariant. So you're integrating over the orbit of this word plus the orbit of this racing operator and all of this together. And then this is clearly gauge invariant. Uh, and then the point is that you've kind of have been able to go from n by matrices to distinguish eigenvalues where the eigenvalue in this case is a coherent state parameter. Okay, so this is a different version of the eigenvalues of the matrices. This is the eigenvalues of the matrices as a coherent state parameter as opposed to eigenvalues of the matrices as eigenvalues of the operator a dagger z. They're very closely related, but it's not quite the same thing. Um, so this is convenient because now you have families of states parameterized by different lambdas. The lambdas are positions of d-brains. Um, and then these are all gauge invariant objects once you take into account how the words need to have a Gauss's law constraint. So this has some residual U1 gauge symmetry floating around here. And to cancel it out for each VI, VI dagger, you need a VI. So you need to kind of cancel the charge of, of each one of these objects. <clears throat> okay. Yes. Yes. Um, well, here, because you're doing U, U inverse, and it's a one matrix model with U, there's no written value transition in this problem uh, because this is the coherent state representation of the, of the, yeah. So this is not, this is not the trace U or plus trace U dagger. This is, this is a different one. Um, okay. Um, Lambda is a general complex matrix that is diagonal because of this kind of reduction to characters and stuff like that. So you can choose it to be diagonal. So you don't even have to choose it upper triangular. Uh, it can be diagonal. So the eigenvalues of lambda have meaning uh, into the own. Okay. So as I said, this is a complementary approach to giant gravitons. There's a whole history of dealing with giant gravitons by combinatorial methods directly. Uh, roughly between various groups, uh, so my group, Robert's group, and Sanjay's group, and a whole bunch of our students, plus collaborators, plus et cetera, et cetera. About 15 years of combinatorics resulted in some kind of way to handle all these objects by, let's say, combinatorics. Once you have these coherent state methods, um, a lot of that combinatorics becomes easier. Uh, and then the point is that uh, the energy of open strings between two of these giant gravitons can be computed in some kind of effective angular momentum square plus the tooth coupling times the difference between these eigenvalues in some unit disk. And then if you have separated only two eigenvalues, the rest of the n minus two eigenvalues from these droplets, and this is this quantum hole effect picture of the half EPS states of any corporeal mills. And this works even if you have some, you know, the formations of the edge and you have some other shapes of these droplets. So the statement is that um, you can do all of this and the coherent state methods seem to improve things a lot. So a lot of the original computations were done, let's say, with one of my students, Eric Jankowski, that was still spin chains. With Adolfo again, we did some space time computations directly in these kind of half EPS geometries. And then we have some work in progress where we're trying to recompute everything that has been done in the new formalism to show that it can be done. Uh, and the new advantage is that because you have a clean set of uh, saddle points, there's extra perturbation parameters that show up because of that, okay? So the idea is that, you know, there's this way of doing half PPS states plus open strings that, that kind of comes out. And as I said, the matrix integrals come in this way naturally from the coherent state object by trying to make gauge invariant states, okay? So here, I'm still doing Hamiltonian physics, and then on averaging or, or finding gauge invariant states, matrix integrals over the unitary group pop up. Beforehand, the matrix integrals pop up from you know, wave functions and overlaps and how to compute that. So the point is that we always get integrals over the UN group. Okay, so, uh, and there's all that, so everything, everywhere, all at once. This is kind of, you know, we keep on going with these methods. Uh, if you haven't seen the movie, it's a lot of fun. Um, 
Uh, but uh, what I'm going to talk about now is about the confinement, the confinement transition. So now we've talked about you know young tableaus, young tableaus with decorations, and now we're going to talk about young tableaus all the way. So I'm going to talk about the two matrix model. Uh, X and Y are in the adjoint. This is a two matrix model. I'm going to choose the quadratic potential, so it's solvable. And then in free theory at large n for the gauge invariant states that are invariant under the adjoint action on X and Y simultaneously. Um, there is a confinement, deconfinement first order phase transition ish, because it's what people call, uh, um, uh, how do you call it? Um, one? Well, no, there's a Hagedorn transition, but more to the point, the, 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 the important point is that um, is what people call a weak first order transition, because on the exit side of the transition, you get non critical exponents. Right? You get critical exponents that are non trivial. So you don't get something that's a true first order transition, you get a weak first order transition. So, you know, there was this paper in 2003 by path integral methods using. Um, uh, uh, using the Polyakov loop that showed that there was this transition. Uh, and then um, the order parameter from the point of view of the Hamiltonian is the dependence with n of the entropy. So if the entropy is of order one, you're in the confining phase transition. And if the entropy is of order n squared, then you're in the high temperature uh, deconfined phase. Uh, and then to get the phase transition, we need to study the density of states with the energy, so we need to count states. So what I'm going to talk about is state counting. So rather than doing things with the Polyakov loop, which is kind of the path into a way, I'm doing similar calculations, but with the counting of states instead. So again, the A can be thought of as a raising operator for the one of the degrees of freedom. The B can be thought of as a raising operator for the second set of degrees of freedom. And then all states are produced by matrix value raising operators acting on the ground state. The ground state is gauge invariant. So the gauge invariant states become traces because you just need to contract indices. So again, you get a picture of closed strings. Um, so basically, you get traces and multi traces. And these are basically strings copied from the ADS dictionary. So this idea that when you write traces, you're writing strings is a canonical way of thinking about how they show up. And then if you have L being the number of letters, the number of states of the one string uh, is roughly 2 to the L over L. If you have the two letters A and B, and you have a string of L letters, you get 2 to the L possible configurations. And this division by L is because traces are cyclic, so you need to divide by that. So roughly, this is true. So you take the log of these number of states, you get L log two, and this log two tells you that the entropy is proportional to L, L is the energy, because that's just the number of boxes that you have or the number of letters that you have, the number of raising operators. Uh, so if you follow the first law, the temperature becomes log two or one over log two, and then multi-traces don't really change this temperature at all. So you get this basic statement that the entropy is proportional to the energy and that's what we call the Hagedorn phase. Uh, basically, when you change the energy, the temperature stays constant. So even though you're trying to push the energy higher, you cannot change the temperature. So that's kind of the limiting temperature of the Hagedorn physics. Uh, so the entropy being proportional to the energy is the Hagedorn density of states. OK, so what's the protocol? The protocol is you study a large energy, but much less than the number of degrees of freedom of the deconfined phase, so one less than E less than N squared. And you want to study what's the typical state inside of this Hagedorn thing in the microcanonical ensemble. So <clears throat> once you are at these energies, the E can be of order N squared, but still you know, 0 0.0001 N squared or something like that. So it can be of order N squared and not of order one. And the point is that if you're of order N squared, even if it's a small number times N squared, then this decomposition into traces is not very useful any longer because traces stop becoming orthogonal roughly when the traces become of order n. So it's more subtle than that, but uh, roughly stated, you can study these states. And then how do you fit this into a matrix? So we go back to our young tableau prescription. So what you can do is count the states by saying, okay, I have raising operators A, I have 
1, 2, all the way up to k indices. So I can decompose these eight daggers into the representations of the upper indices under un. There's a second action of un in the lower indices. In the free theory, these two uns can be independent of each other. So you can just count states by the first un. Uh, so this transforms as a tensor of un on the upper indices and un in the lower indices. And because the a's are bosonic, the young tableau that you get for the upper indices is equal to the young tableau of the lower indices. Okay. Uh, it transforms as a tensor. You decompose into reducible representations. So you do young diagrams, you symmetrize and anti-symmetrize. And because they're different irreps of un, they're automatically orthogonal. So this is an orthogonal decomposition of states. And all states can be written in this way. Um, okay, uh, what do you do? You do the same for the B. So now you have two young diagrams, one for A, one for B. You take their tensor product, and then you decompose this tensor product into the possible representations that you get of the UN that acts on the upper indices of both A and B simultaneously. So now instead of doing just one UN, you have four UNs, one for A, one for B, and then, oh, sorry, two for A, two for B, and then you join the diagonal of the upper indices of A and B and decompose into that. So once you do this decomposition, you're decomposing things in orthogonal states. And then, you know, if we have the fixed energy E, we need E boxes equal to what was the parameter L before. Um, and then when you count states, you have to count how many copies of this A plus B kind of show up in this tensor product. And then you get these little wood richards or coefficients, one for the upper indices, another one for the lower indices. And then to make things gauge invariant, there needs to be an invariant state. So the upper index young diagram needs to be equal to the lower index young diagram. And then you have these many possibilities. And then you have to sum over all these young diagrams. And then it turns out that there's not very many young diagrams. Young diagrams are partitions of n. They go like, or partitions of L, they go like e to the square root of L, and the number of states went like e to the L, so square root of L is just not enough. So that means that these numbers can get large, so there's large coefficients in some of these little Richardson coefficients, and that lets you believe that there might be a young diagram shape that dominates. Okay, so if there's a young diagram shape that dominates, we can go and find it. Uh, these are resulting combinatorics that we dug up from the math literature. The shape that dominates these little Richardson coefficients is this kind of weird cardioid-like shape. Um, uh, it's described in terms of this S variable and this function. Uh, it, it's kind of the shape is this one, which is this function over here, and then uh, the absolute value over here, the absolute value marks the edges of the young diagram. You have to take this thing, rotate it 45 degree angle, and then that's, that's how you get the shape. Uh, so you have to put the, the, the corner in the right place. Uh, but you have a, a, a shape. Uh, and then you can ask, what does this shape do? It, it, maximi it maximizes the little with Richardson coefficient. The other thing that it's doing, it's essentially maximizing the dimension of the representations for a fixed number of boxes. So what you're actually doing is you are minimizing this, this kind of combinatorial denominator that shows up, which is the, the hook length formula. So you're, you're minimizing the hook length, uh, and then to convince you that it's true, the little bit Richardson coefficients as a function of the log of the hook length gets dominated by the lower values over here. And you know, these are different values of the energy with different you know, truncations in N, and it's the same for everything, and then, you know, we do four by four, five by five, six by six matrices and try to fit E divided by N squared and the free energy divided by N squared. And we try to see that there's a phase transition here at one quarter. Uh, and then for N large, you just don't quite get there. And for the lower ends, you see that you more or less collapse different values of N on roughly the same curve, which is typical of large N calculations. Okay. So this is numerics. This is because we couldn't do it analytically. We couldn't figure this out analytically. But the statement is that you, know, you can do it at different values of the charge divided by the energy. 
And sometimes the numerics, because little riches and coefficients are numerically hard to compute. Uh, what that means is that we put them on software. The software can take a while, but if you do all young tableaus with all things, it takes a bit longer. And then these are complicated to compute, meaning they're computed recursively, and the recursion is not that well behaved. Uh, so it, it takes a while to, to, to get things. Okay, so what's going on is that when you do this, um, because we have the shape, you can say where the transition is, is when the shape touches the bottom end that's allowed by UN representations. So what we found is that the energy is n squared over four. This is the prediction from the typical shape. The n squared over four is this one over here, roughly correct. This is what typical numerics look like in, in, in this problem. Um, and then uh, if you want to see more of this stuff, then Joe's talk is probably gonna tell us the other version of this story. <laughs> um, so the idea is that we get a prediction just from this kind of combinatorial point of view. And, and just to remind you, this is an analytic shape, right? So you get a nice curve. This is the typical question that combinatorial problems in gauge theory eventually become some type of geometric problem, which is a shape or something like that that one can describe. And this is something that happens again and again in string theory, that combinatorial problems in the right regime become a type of geometric object, curve, or some other analytic function. Okay, so we have the pictures, and now we have the end, the conclusion. <laughs> so, again, this is, case theories lead to spin chains. Um, we've seen this again and again. It happened in n equal four, it happens in large NQCD from strong coupling. There's a lot of ways these spin chains are constructed, but if you're doing planar diagrams and large n, you get some effective one plus one dimensional field theory. Um, the second statement that I want to remind you of is that gauge invariant states are closely related to the representation theory of UN. So there's a, a statement is that things in the agent and transform upper indices in some representation, lower indices in another representation. And then there's some representation content, even though you're studying gauge singlets of UN, there's still representation content of these two UNs that are floating around that give you representation content of UN from the matrices, okay? So characters and young tableaus show up repeatedly because of all of these. Um, it's not surprising a posteriori, but the first time one sees it, it might be a little bit shocking that, you know, even though you're doing singlets, you're still counting young tableau, okay? Um, and then the second statement is that integrals over UN appear repeatedly, either from averaging over states or from computing overlaps, or, you know, it's not just a generalization of matrix models that one can do, it's just they show up again and then again. Um, the other statement, which is, you know, uh, well known is that if you have localization formula, uh, not only do you get exact results, you also get good approximations from leading saddles, okay? So localization, the, the fact that there's some story about localization of these high PPS states and this relation to the uh, BPIZ integral and, and vice or stuff like that, is still something that's new and hasn't been explored enough. And we know that when there's localization, there's a lot of exact or semi-exact so, or closely to analytic results that one can extract from them, and this is part of the work in progress that we're doing. Uh, combining, you know, uh, gauge invariance, gauge theories, and characters, we can get aspects of phase transitions. Uh, so partial deconfinement to full deconfinement. The partial deconfinement here is the statement, and I didn't emphasize this enough, that if you do this and you have some number of boxes, you can basically divide the number of boxes into two groups. The ones that have some occupation here in this shape and the ones that don't, and that's like a splitting of eigenvalues because boxes in young tableaus for one matrix models are related to eigenvalues. So this gives you a way to split out eigenvalues into the ones that behave as being excited and deconfined and the ones that are, are being unexcited and deconfined, and then this gives you a gauge invariant way of splitting them by looking at the young diagram itself. So that gives you an abstract way to extract the notion of eigenvalues from Young diagrams, okay? And then finally, 
uh, the last statement I want to make is that, you know, when you have a combinatorial problem and you ask about typicality and you take a scaling limit, a typicality question can become a geometric problem, as in find a curve that does this or find a shape that does that. Uh, if you remember, maybe not, um, if you've seen topological partition functions, some of them are related to filling corners of a cube and crystal melting. That also leads to a typical shape, and people you know, were able to find that way Calabi-Yau manifolds. So there's all kinds of things like that that show up where the right geometrization of a scaling limit of combinatorial problems becomes geometric, okay? Again, this is the, the, the pitch is that, you know, you put it all together and sooner or later you're doing too much. Thank you very much.